All right. Um, well, thank you everyone for joining uh, the Santa Clara Valley San Francisco joint chapter of the Microwave Theory and Technology Society of the IEEE. Our April 2022 Tech Talk is um, on distributed phased arrays, challenges and recent progress by Professor uh, Nanzer of Michigan State. Um, Professor Nanzer is also a distinguished lecturer of the MTT. I'm just going to go through a few slides and then uh, uh, we'll get gone with the talk. Um, so I'm going to introduce the officers. Um, we're, we're moving out of COVID. I'm going to announce the May event is hybrid. Uh, and um, um, shout out to uh, everyone to, to register for IMS. Uh, get your hotel reservations before they go away. Um, and then we'll um, go into the talk. So um, this meeting is being recorded and it's you know, clearly it's being broadcast to us all on Zoom. Um, the professor has agreed to allow the recorded video to be distributed to registrants and um, a version of the slides will be made available. So we're keeping all the cameras off except for uh, profess the professor. Um, and during Q&A periods, which will be announced, we'll ask that you raise your hand with the raise hand button, and then we'll um, either Tan or myself or Darren uh, will call on you um, and ask you, you know, we click a button to unmute, you know, ask you to unmute, and then you unmute yourself, and then you'll be able to ask your question. Um, we ask that you, your display name in Zoom matches the name you use to register so that we can uh, check you in. We um, you know, we're an all-volunteer organization, and one of the ways we get credit for our efforts um, with, and getting your great participation is by recording everyone who showed up. That you know, and then uh, and then we report that to um, the section, and then uh, that's the way we keep things going because they they can see that as evidence. So please um, change your name to the one used um, to register if it's not the same, and then. Uh, uh, one of my colleagues will be able to uh, check you in. So I want to mention that um, our May talk is going to be a hybrid. So we're moving, moving out of the complete COVID lockdown uh, and it'll be held in the, the pardon me, the in-person will be held in the Global Founders Trading Room, 2600 Great America Way in Santa Clara. And of course we'll do the Zoom thing here as we're doing for those who um, where it's inconvenient to be there, or they're coming from um, a different location, you know, the East Coast or wherever. So um, we do open the doors typically for these in-person things historically at six, and we do some we'll have some food, and then there's a chance for networking and um, exploring opportunities with your colleagues uh, informally. Um, the Santa Clara Valley SF Chapters 2022 officers are myself, Tom McKay, I'm chair, vice chair is Venkata Gade. I'm not sure if Venkata is able to make it today. Uh, Darren Phelps is our secretary. And Tan Tu, who you've heard, uh, is the treasurer. Um, the IEEE is the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers, and we advance technology for humanity through highly cited publications, conferences, technology standards, and professional and educational activities such as this one. And the Microwave Theory and actually Technology Society, its name has changed uh, very recently, uh, focuses on the theory and application of radio frequency guided wave and wireless technologies. So uh, become a member. Uh, you can join the IEEE at IEEE.org membership or join the MTT at uh, MTT.org, join MTT. Um, I also will point out that the IEEE is a 501c3 and you can make a donation. There's a link in one of the closing slides. I um, forgot to put it in here. Um, we are going to have an in-person IMS in Denver. Um, I'm actually on the steering committee. Um, we're inaugurating a demo session um, type of um, a piece of the technical program this year for the first time, and I'm 
involved with that and some and the, um, other benefits to industrial authors. Um, so uh, anyway, it's this is, it's one of the best conferences of the IEEE, and I've been going um, with rare exception since 1985, and uh, I highly recommend attending. And you can register now at the um, IMS IEEE.org. So, um, Darren, how are you doing on audio? Am I there? Can you hear me? And Tom can. Perfect. Okay, I, 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 I'm I'm solved. I'm back. Perfect. Awesome. Just in time. Just in time. Just in time so, to exactly to introduce our speaker tonight and uh, talk about the presentation. Thanks, Tom. I'll take over. Um, okay. So I think we're in for a, a great presentation tonight from from Professor Nanzer. Um, the abstract and this presentation. This is his uh, his IEEE DML paper. Stands for Distinguished Microwave Lecture. Um, I'm sure you've all read the abstract. I'm not going to read it in detail, but I just want to point out some of the things that I'm personally looking forward to in the presentation. I'm looking forward to the the recent progress in microwave technologies that's going to one that allows array coordination. How do you do this distributed phase array coordination? Um, in specifics, how do you achieve phase coherence at these microwave frequencies? Uh, not trivial. Um, specifically with things like the uh, oscillator drift on beamformer performance. Um, and I know he's going to take us through different architectures that allows this microwave and millimeter wave technologies to how they do phase coherent synchronization um, with specific areas of high accuracy internode ranging, wireless frequency transfer, and high accuracy time alignment. And then the lecture ends with an open challenge in distributed phase arrays and where where the future future lies in technology. So I think that's going to be um, very interesting and exciting. Um, next page, Tom, do I have? Perfect. So in terms of biography, uh, once again, you can read this, this. This is an awesome biography. But what I love about it was you see a guy who gets his BS degree from Michigan State in 2003, goes on to achieve PhDs and master's degrees from University of Austin, Texas joins John Hopkins University uh, at the Applied Physics Lab and leads their advanced microwave and millimeter wave technology section. That's 2009 to 2016. So after, after he got his academia degrees, goes out and goes back and then comes back full circle to Michigan State, go Spartans, to join the faculty. So love to see the full circle in action. And I'm sure he's got some stories of maybe other students that were there when he was there and now are either other faculties or, or got to see those go on. So with no further ado, let's let's get to the featured presentation and have Professor Nanzer share his paper with us. Thanks so much, Darren, and good. thanks, Tom, for the intro. Should I, should I take it from here? You should take it from here. Yeah, That's good, right. thanks. Thanks so much. Okay, there we go. Hopefully you're seeing presentation now. Yeah, yep, thank, you so much the, thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, yeah, as Darren said, I kind of uh, kind of made a, made a little circle around the center in, of the U.S. and the East Coast and made it back to Michigan State University. And it's, it's, uh, it's been interesting to work as work uh, alongside a lot of the professors that I that I learned, uh, you know, my my early electromagnetics from it's a it's been pretty a pretty exciting time. Um, so I'm going to get into my, my talk on distributed phased arrays in a second here, but the first thing I want to do as a representative of MTT, I want to build on a little bit of what Tom was saying about joining IEEE and MTT. And I do want to encourage you, if you're not already, to become a member of IEEE um, or, and or MTT. Um, there are a number of benefits. Tom has already kind of outlined some of those. Uh, certainly there's, you know, discounts on the, the top publications in our field, the top conferences in our field, um, getting access you know, to uh, all the emerging research and emerging uh, topics. Um, from a personal standpoint, one thing I do wanna point out are the, the special interest groups, the volunteer opportunities. I got involved in MTT very early on, right, right when I graduated uh, from UT Austin. Uh, MTT was actually the first, IMS was the first conference I went to. MTT was the first journal I published in. Um, I, I've been involved in it, you know, my my entire career, and it's just been hugely rewarding to be um, a member of the um, different groups and volunteering in some of the technical um, committees, 
supporting uh, the conference IMS. Um, and so I highly encourage, you know, looking at volunteer opportunities and places you can get actively involved in IEEE and MTT. It's, it's very rewarding. Um, you know, you meet a lot of great people along the way, build your network, but you also, you know, kind of have an inside view of how things are working and you're kind of at the front lines of directing, you know, helping to direct where the society is going. And so I, I, I really do encourage, you know, becoming a member and then looking at some of the volunteer opportunities. Um, you, you all know that the top publications, so I'm not going to dwell on these, but there's a couple of other slides um, just to kind of show you, you know, some of the uh, publications and the conferences and, and some of the activities that you can be involved in. But again, I, I highly encourage you to not only become a member, but act, you know, try to get actively involved in it. it. It really is a huge benefit. There's a cost breakdown here um, that um, uh, I've been asked to show, and so so here it is. I'm happy to come back to this at the end of the at the end of the talk if there are questions on any of this. I'll be happy to chat about it. Okay, but without uh, further ado, we'll get into the the technical presentation. So just a brief outline. I'm going to talk about distributed phased arrays and the challenges that are involved in coordinating them. I'm going to talk about different topologies and uh, that are in the literature and how we can uh, uh, how we can enable the coordination between separate platforms um, to get to a distributed phase coherent operation. Uh, a lot of what I'll talk about in the slide in the presentation are microwave technologies that will enable the phase coherence uh, between separate platforms um, that are coordinated wirelessly and that might be in motion. I'll show some demonstration systems that my group has done building on these microwave technologies uh, for open loop distributed beam forming uh, demonstration systems. Um, in the latter half of the talk, I'm going to talk about some open challenges. Distributed phase arrays is a, is a very challenging topic. Um, and what I'm going to show you is uh, technologies addressing some of the fundamental challenges, but there are additional challenges that remain before these uh, become systems that can be you know, actively fielded. Um, so there, we'll talk about a few of those and some um, uh, solutions that, uh, that we've been exploring and to address those challenges. Um, and then some opportunities afforded by distributed phase arrays for new research directions and new technologies. Now I'll break kind of uh, somewhere after the demonstration systems uh, and ask questions around that point or uh, see if you guys have questions around that point. And then we'll uh, move on to the remainder of the talk. So distributed phased arrays, what we're, what we're trying to do is overcome a platform-centric paradigm that's been very uh, traditional in microwave wireless systems. When we talk about whether it's radar or communication system, when we talk about increasing the capabilities of these systems, whether it's gain or throughput or you know, increase uh, signal power, things like that. We look at things like increasing the number of elements, so increasing the size of the array, uh, for example. Um, uh, re replacing the amplifiers behind the elements is another thing we can do, or the actual transmitters and, and transceivers. Um, but these have limitations in terms of how far we can scale them. Certainly, we can't go to arbitrarily large array sizes just because they have to go on platforms, they have to be implemented somewhere. And there are also challenges, as many of you are aware, with uh, the technologies uh, uh, advancing and uh, advancing the component technologies as well. And so what we look to do with distributed phase arrays is to take the functionality of these single systems and to disaggregate them amongst collections of smaller, lower cost platforms that are wirelessly coordinated and that may even be in motion. And there's a few things we're interested in um, with these topologies in my group. One is the electromagnetics aspect of these uh, systems in terms of what their radiation patterns look like. They're uh, a sparse array, their platforms are moving around, so there's dynamics in, in them. And so I'll talk about some aspects related to those radiation patterns later on. Um, but in order to support aspects using the uh, electromagnetics, the radiation aspects of this, we have to coordinate them. And so what's going on in these arrows between them, the wireless coordination is a very significant um, research challenge. And that's what I'll spend a lot of time talking about. This is what my group spends a lot of time uh, researching and developing. So for the distributed phase array, we're, you know, we're interested in these two aspects of how do we make them work together? And then how do we use them once they're working together? We can look at things like doing the same functionality of a large system, 
So for some applications like um, satellite remote sensing, for example, we might want to field a large number of small low cost platforms that are wirelessly coordinated to perform the same functionality of a single large system, which is less feasible to launch, for example. So we've all seen the Starlink satellites going up um, in, in droves basically. And so if we can coordinate them, they can create the functionality of a single large system. And we have aspects in terms of, of, of beneficial aspects in terms of reliability. So if a few of them go down, the rest of the network is still there performing its functions. We can add more nodes to the array, things like that. Um, but also because it's a larger system, just physically distributed uh, over a larger area, there are some aspects that we can use in terms of the electromagnetics um, properties of that type of system if it's properly coordinated in order to get to functionalities that we can never get with a single platform. And so uh, in the later uh, part of the talk, I'll, I'll discuss some of, the, um, some of the aspects of distributed arrays and how we're using them early on, um, using the same types of characteristics early on um, in some uh, different types of research uh, 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 directions. So certainly remote sensing from, um, or even communications from satellites or even um, uh, uh, aircraft is, is of interest. At Michigan State, we have a large group doing connected and autonomous vehicles. And so we've been very interested in uh, coherent co-processing of information between um, platforms, semi-autonomous and fully autonomous platforms to increase the um, situational awareness or improve safety of these vehicles. Um, at Michigan State, we're also, we're an agricultural college. And so precision agriculture is, is an emerging area of interest. Um, and so things where we can launch, for example, a, an array of low cost drones performing, um, uh, for, in this case, this would be a passive remote sensing operation to uh, estimate the soil moisture content. Um, with a larger array, we can, we can potentially get to uh, a, a narrower spatial resolution. This would allow us to down to almost the crop level to determine what the soil moisture is for a very efficient irrigation. And if we can do this with low cost platforms with drones, and it becomes a low cost solution um, to, to, help, um, uh, uh, to help with irrigation and, and drought problems. So these are kind of sensing capabilities that I'm talking about here. There certainly are aspects in terms of communications um, as uh, communications networks, particularly millimeter wave systems go to higher and higher frequencies. There are issues with blockages, line of sight. So with multiple coherent connections, not only can we introduce redundancy into that system so that we have more connections, but we can also increase the throughput. We have multiple coherent links. Um, we have a higher signal uh, to noise ratio. And so we can increase uh, the amount of uh, throughput getting to that user. And both aspects, communications and remote sensing apply um, for um, extraterrestrial type applications. We might be communicating with an array of platforms around the moon or another uh, celestial object from the deep space network, which could then be doing sensing or communications. Um, to an object on the surface. So there's a number of applications where distributed phase arrays could play um, a huge role in the future and would have a lot of potential. So more specifically about some of the benefits of distributed phase arrays. Um, one of uh, some of these I've alluded to already, one of the principal ones we talk about is enhanced signal gain. So we've got a number of platforms we're cohering their operations. So we have on transmit, we have an increase in power because we just have a larger number of elements on transmitting but we also get directivity. So we have a larger array, so we get a, di a directive gain. On receive, we also get a directive gain. And so this, this scales as n cubed if we do everything fully coherently on transmit and receive. Signal gain is a common one that is a common metric that we actually use to characterize how well we can cohere systems. It's a nice um, uh, sort of, um, it, it's, a, it's a metric that kind of wraps up a lot of the aspects of distributed phase arrays. And, and especially in terms of the errors that can, that can manifest in the system. And so it allows us to determine how well our system is, is coherent. And so we use a coherent gain uh, very frequently as a metric. But there are other um, aspects of distributed phase arrays that are um, uh, very significant when we compare them to single platform systems like increased reliability, as I mentioned, you've got a distributed system now. So if you lose a couple of them due to failures or interference, um, the entire system uh, can still, the rest of the system can still function. It's scalable, we can add more nodes to the array, we can remove nodes uh, from the array if we want to change how, this, how the uh, system is functioning. It's adaptable, so if we want to 
um, uh, change it if the mission is changing. If we want to say federate the array into two subarrays that are each doing different functions, we have the capability to do that. Also, the greater spatial diversity, as I mentioned, we're, we're separating these elements over a wider space than we would give in a single platform. So this is going to yield narrower beams. It's also going to yield grading loads. So I'm going to talk about those later in the in the um, later in the talk later in the uh, presentation. So. I, I, as I mentioned in the beginning, that there are a number of challenges that are associated with getting a distributed phase coherent operation working uh, in practice. And what we're focused on in my group are addressing the fundamental challenges of um, implementing distributed phase coherence. So if we've got three platforms, we often consider a transmit operation because if we can transmit coherently, then we pretty much set up the system to both transmit and receive coherently. I'll, I'll talk a little bit later about receive side um, coherence um, beam forming as well. But you know, the idea is these are sending out signals, they're pulsed signals on some carrier and they have some modulation on them. We want them to arrive at a, at a destination so that they, they sum coherently. So we get a nice uh, coherent superposition from those signals. The principal error terms, the fundamental error terms that manifest in any distributed operation uh, are phase misalignment, frequency mismatch, and, and time misalignment. So I'm showing on the bottom left summation of, of two signals. This would be in, uh, in the far field, um, for example, of two signals um, being transmitted. Um, and so we get a nice boost of the gain, as we see if we do everything perfectly coherently. Our phase is misaligned, just an example of what can happen when you're almost 180 80 degrees out of phase, those signals can cancel. And of course, you get a very low gain out of that. So even if we do align the phases, though, if the frequencies are mismatched, they're going to gradually rotate in and out of phase coherence. And then we'll get sort of the beat pattern as, as what's shown here. If the frequencies are not aligned. Uh, finally, there's a, a time misalignment. Um, and so even if we've got the phases, frequencies aligned, if the timing is off, which is kind of down to the, which, which is down to the um, level of the information bandwidth, um, and they don't overlap appreciably, as we can see here, we've got a binary phase shift keyed signal. Um, half the signal is nulling because it's got 180 degree phase shift in the information. So it's only overlapped by about 50%. And so we get sort of a, a nulling of the information. So these are the three principal aspects um, that we have to, um, that we have to implement in order for a, a phase coherent uh, operation to do sensing or communications. The phase and the frequency are dependent on the carrier on the carrier frequency. So basically, the wavelength of the signal that we're sending out. So the absolute precision and accuracy that you need for these is, is quite small. That's on the wavelength level. Time alignment has to do with the information. So we've got a pulse signal. If we have the phases and frequencies aligned, we just have to get the envelopes aligned on top of this. So that's at the level, at, at the time levels at the, at the inverse of the information bandwidth. So at an absolute level, time alignment is orders of magnitude less stringent than phase and frequency alignment. We do um, quite a bit of work on time alignment as well. In this talk, I'm gonna focus um, um, in the time that we have for phase, on phase alignment and frequency um, and frequency alignment. And again, these are kind of the fundamental ones we need to get a coherent operation with a, C, with a continuous wave signal. And then we add time alignment on top of that and we can um, add information onto it. So one thing we wanted to look at when we started um, evaluating how we can implement a distributed uh, uh, phase coherent operation is what are the error tolerances that, would, that we would have on some of these basic um, coordination aspects. So I'm going to show here uh, what I'm talking about here is phase error tolerance, and this is a um, um, this uh, the phase the phase error manifests from multiple sources. Frequency mismatch will give you a residual phase error over a certain amount of time. If you have clock errors, um, phase noise, things like that, those all roll into um, a phase error turn. So the first thing we looked at was just if we got an ideal signal, everything works great and we have a signal with phase errors, just a bulk phase error in this case. What we evaluated is uh, what we call the coherent gain. So as I mentioned, we use you know, the gain of the array as a, as a metric and, and specifically what we use is um, uh, the coherent gain, which is the magnitude or the power of our received signal with errors relative to the received signal in an ideal case. So if everything works well, this is one. Um, if, it's complete, if it's completely off, um, you get a zero from this. If it's um, completely randomized, it should be about, it should be 0.5. So the coherent gain um, is something we want to be very, very close to one. And what we do is look at the probability given a number of different errors. 
a um, number of different uh, independent errors, the probability that this coherent gain will exceed some threshold. And we usually set that to about 0.9. So we're getting about 90% of our ideal coherent gain. And this gives us about a half EV degradation in the main beam. So you can set this threshold to whatever is relevant for your application. We, use, we usually use 0.9. So just looking at total phase errors in our system, um, if we want a high probability of achieving that 0.99% coherent gain, our phase errors have to be about 18 degrees or less. And so from this chart, what we see is that this is a standard, de standard deviation of the phase errors as a function of the number of elements. Um, so going up to arbitrarily large arrays. And the probability is shown on the vertical axis. So up here, a very high probability of getting 90% coherent gain. Here, a very low probability. So this cutoff here is right at about 18 degrees. So our standard deviation, we want to be about 18 degrees or less of our, this is our basically our total phase error budget. So when we talk about phase errors, whatever they derive from, we're looking for something like 18 degrees or less. Now, this, these are distributed phase arrays. So when we implement um, a, a phase array operation, we have to do beam steering. And what that means is we have to, um, if we've got two elements, we have to implement a phase on one of them that overcomes the propagation delay that's commensurate with the angle and the separation between the platforms. So for implementing a, a phase steering operation, we have to estimate the distance between the platforms. We also have, have to estimate the angles. This is a little bit less stringent in the work that we've been looking at. It's not insignificant, but the, more, uh, the much more significant challenge is estimating the separation between the platforms. When we look at a similar metric or a similar, um, similar statistics on the coherent gain in terms of just the error in the internode uh, range on um, standard deviation, um, that comes down to about a 15th of a wavelength of whatever frequency you're transmitting. So that's pretty stringent um, and, it's hard, and, it's, and it's quite challenging to get for a microwave system. We'll talk about ways that we do that. This does not line up right uh, exactly with this 18 degrees. The reason being is that we've randomized the error or randomized the angle here. And what that means is if we're broadside to two elements, steering broadside, um, their position really doesn't matter. As long as they're in phase and they're steering broadside, they can be at any separation and, and it's going to cohere. And fire is the worst case. So any little deviation has an impact on the phase. And so this is randomized uh, over all those angles. And so on average, what we're looking for is this 15th of a wavelength. So this is for phase error. And again, everything kind of wraps into this, whether it's, it's frequency uh, or phase, anything relative to the carrier frequency. Uh, I mentioned there's also timing considerations that we have to consider, but those have to do with the waveform that we're sending out. Um, so for example, if we're sending out a monotone pulse, just a CW pulse signal um, to get to a high level of coherent gain at 0.9, it uh, comes out to be about, you know, we can, we can deal with about a 10% error, 10% uh, standard deviation of uh, relative to the pulse duration. It kind of makes sense, right? We want 90% of those pulses to overlap in order to get 90% of the coherent gain. This is just for a CW signal that's amplitude modulated. Once we add modulation onto that signal frequency modulation, for example, uh, things get much more stringent. So I'm showing a linear frequency modulated waveform here. And now we care about not only the standard deviation the timing error relative to the pulse width, but uh, also the, the modulation rate. So the faster the modulation rate is, the more stringent they have to be. Again, this is very dependent on the waveform, um, and, but you can come up with uh, similar curves for whatever uh, waveform you're interested in, whether it's a Barker code or whether it's um, uh, just looking at QPSK or BPSK or something like that. So again, we're gonna focus um, uh, principally on the phase uh, and frequency and coordination in this talk. So some of the system level aspects that can impact um, the distributed, um, uh, distributed phase coherence, um, in addition to, or, or sorry, that can impact some of the phase errors, for example, uh, things like phase noise in the oscillators, um, platforms, if they're vibrating, things are moving. Again, we're estimating these separations. So if the platforms are vibrating, um, we, have to, we have to know that basically in order to correct for it. If there's Doppler shifts, the platforms are moving relative to one another very quickly. Um, and then there are system phases um, just within the transceivers themselves. So th this is not an exhaustive list. There are certainly a, a, a number of other system um, uh, uh, aspects that can impact beam forming. Um, again, these things tend to be very application specific. So for example, vibration profiles on some platforms are not as much of an issue as they are on others. Um, so they do come up more um, in application specific scenarios. But importantly, some of them can be calibrated. Some of them can be adjusted for, and some of them we just have to characterize or minimize. 
So things like um, system phase delays, we can calibrate for those if they're static. There might be temperature variations, but we can potentially monitor those. Uh, Doppler shifts, we can potentially measure the uh, relative velocities of the platform so we can correct for that. Um, other things like the um, uh, vibration profile of the platform is something we just may have to deal with. So if we're measuring the separation between the platforms down a 15th of a wavelength and we've got something like a helicopter that's got a really um, rough vibration profile, we may have to update very frequently because once we've measured that distance, we're trying to implement a coherent operation. The platform could vibrate out of that coherence length by the time we've implemented that operation. So we may have to update that more frequently. And so we've looked at various um, vibration profiles of different platforms, whether they're jet aircraft or helicopters. And uh, as you expect, ones that have a, a more, again, a more rough vibration profile, the update rate that we have to get to, to, or that we have to use to get to a high level of coherent gain tends to be much, much shorter. Um, platforms that are, um, have lower vibration profiles, we can deal with a longer update rate between, um, uh, between measurements. Phase noise is another one um, that impacts uh, the system in a similar way. Um, when we look at phase noise, we have to look at how the topology is distributing um, the signals. We're gonna have a primary reference that's gonna be wirelessly transmitted in our case to a system that may have something like a phase lock loop, secondary oscillator. And so we have to look at the overall phase noise profile of the system um, and how it impacts um, the, the, res the resultant phase of our transmitted signals. And, um, you know, as it turns out, as might be expected, a higher stability oscillator usually is better in order to allow us to kind of flywheel through um, uh, through update intervals. Um, it's more stable, so we can measure it once. We know it's going to be stable within a certain amount of time. We don't have to measure it as frequently. With uh, lower cost op uh, oscillators, just quartz crystal oscillators, um, we have to measure those uh, more frequently, so the update update times are shorter. Um, and basically, it's, it's again, it's characterizing the system fast enough so that we can um, adjust for um, any of these um, uh, system parameters. Now, none of these are on the order of, you know, you know, nanosecond level. These are all kind of feasible levels. You know, they're, they're um, you know, in the millisecond ranges. And what we usually use is something around a 10 millisecond type update rate. And that gets us well below some of the um, proper, some of these uh, curves that we're seeing on these. And so we know that it can support um, beam forming for um, typical architectures. Um, and certainly if we're doing something like continuous locking, so there's some architectures, particularly with frequency transfer, where we might be able to do continuous frequency uh, synchronization, then we can get by with any oscillator pretty much um, because we're continuously uh, locking and we don't have to worry about the drift. So again, there are a number of um, uh, system level aspects um, that uh, kind of impact how we can do the beam forming, but what we're interested in is how we can um, address some of the basic challenges, right? These, these, the phase coherence and in principle, measuring those separations between the platforms so we can actually do a distributed beam forming operation, how we can transfer the frequencies so that the frequency locks. So if we can measure the separation, we can calibrate out system errors. We can measure the separation while they're moving. We can lock the frequencies. Now we've got phase and we've got frequency. We can do a coherent beam forming operation with a CW signal. So what are some of the topologies that we would look at if we're trying to do this coordination? There are two general architectures that we would look at for distributed phase coherence uh, coordination. Um, one is what we call closed loop. This is the case where we have a set of elements um, that are transmitting to a system and that system is providing feedback to those elements. Closed loop in this sense means that the, um, it's closed loop with respect to the targeted location or the destination where we're sending our signal. There are some um, very nice benefits of this type of architecture, um, which include minimal coordination between the actual elements. They have to know what they're transmitting, but at, that's pretty much all they absolutely need to know. Um, they need, um, otherwise, this base station can provide a lot of feedback to um, these nodes to help them get to a coherent state. And you can even do this with as little as one bit of information. And so there have been some studies that have shown Basically, if the base station is just saying signal is better or worse, eventually these nodes can come to converge to a coherent state and they can get good coherent gain on that base station. Um, they don't need to know their separations. Um, depending on the architecture, they may have to do frequency synchronization, they may have to do some timing synchronization, but a lot of um, the principal challenges of aligning the phases are taken care of. The, the challenge with this is it's only transmitting to that base station. It's only transmitting to the point that's giving them the feedback. 
cannot arbitrarily steer a beam. So it's not really a beam forming operation in, in some sense. It's a, um, it's, a, it's, a coherent, it's a coherent operation to another node in the system, um, but it's not an arbitrary beam forming operation. It can be consume, time consuming depending on the um, type of um, uh, algorithm that's being run. So for that one bit feedback uh, system, as I mentioned, um, it can take some time for that to actually converge to a high coherent state. So if the platforms are actually moving around, that becomes a bit of an issue. It may not converge within, within time. Um, and, and finally, you know, when we talk about coherent gain, one of the big benefits of a distributed uh, a phase array is you've got more gain, you can get your signal further. Um, in this case, though, each of these individual nodes has to be able to detect a signal from the space station. So it's, it's got to have a link already individually. And so it doesn't, in any of these cases where you want to rely on the array gain to get to a farther distance to get to the space station, these uh, may not be feasible. So the, on the flip side of this, these, these, these are closed loop topologies. Uh, there are open loop topologies. And this is where the array um, completely self aligns. And then it can steer a beam to any destination it's, it's looking for. So basically a, a general uh, wireless beam forming uh, architecture. This is, um, uh, it's more challenging in what we have to coordinate between the nodes. So we have to know the positions. That's one of the principal challenges of an open loop system. Is we have to know the relative separations of these platforms um, down to that 15th of a wavelength in order to get this beam forming operation. We have to align the frequencies um, as well. Um, and so there's more that has to happen between the elements, it makes that significantly more challenging. Um, but it does allow us um, to steer a beam to any direction. When we can do that, we can do sensing, we can do communications, we can do any wireless operation. Closed loop systems, because they rely on active feedback from another system, it's really a communication system um, with uh, you know, sort of a few other things that you can do with it as well. Um, but it doesn't allow an, an arbitrary wireless operation like we can do with an open loop system. Um, and because we don't rely on a signal from the destination, this could be another system, it could be a point on the ground, so we could be doing just remote sensing. Um, in addition to the strict coordination, there are other um, um, restrictions or, or challenges with this type, of, this type of system in that um, the channel errors are not inherently corrected. So if you've got a target that is very close to the array, um, you would have to range to that array actually very accurately in order to get over sort of the parallax issues of sending these signals at different angles. Um, so what we're going to consider is a far field operation. Um, which is that we're, we're cohering this array and we're gonna steer this beam to a far field direction. So we've got parallel um, uh, steering directions. So let's talk about the, the coordination aspects. As I mentioned, relative position is one of the most challenging aspects of these open loop systems. So we look at this, um, we can look at this in a, in, a, in a pairwise fashion. You can look at it in a distributed fashion as well. Um, but to kind of get to a sense of what we're trying to do, we can look at this from uh, coordinating them in a pairwise fashion, which you could do in sort of a daisy chain manner um, if, um, in, in the array. But we've got two nodes, they're gonna to steer to some direction. We have to estimate this baseline vector um, between them. And again, measuring this distance down to a 15th of a wavelength is, is the challenge. So we started looking into this and wanted to um, you know, figure out how well can we actually measure the separation between these platforms. Um, we know I got to get to this really short, you know, really, you know, really fine ranging accuracy. Um, and we knew that was something we could potentially do with optical systems. Optical systems have a lot of bandwidth. And so from a radar perspective, we think more bandwidth, we can get a better range measurement. Uh, the problem or the challenge with optical systems is scalability. We want to be uh, able to make this work on arrays of tens, even hundreds of nodes. And so having to have that many optical connections um, uh, gets to be a, a significant challenge in the technology that we're looking at, um, you know, currently doesn't really support a, a flexible way of doing that. What we'd like to do is have more of a broadcast operation is have a microwave system that can just, you know, with some, maybe some directionality, but doesn't have to go through the pointing acquisition and tracking that an optical system does and the adaptive optics, things like that. Um, to be able to more like broadcast a signal to another node um, and um, use some of the existing microwave technology that we could potentially use for also for frequency transfer um, and communications or, uh, or other um, links between the nodes. So we looked at basically the, the theoretical accuracy of measuring the delay of a microwave signal. So if you just got a, a, a radar signal, it's got some time, dom uh, some time domain um, 
representation, we might have a Doppler shift, some noise, and some amplitude. The theoretical accuracy or the lower bound on our estimates of the delay of sending out that signal and receiving it is um, dependent on a few different parameters of that waveform. So amplitude of the signal, noise power spectral density, this is one over the signal to noise ratio effectively. There's two terms that depend on the waveform uh, characteristics. So one is the mean frequency, and this is the, the first moment of the spectrum of the signal. And usually this is zero um, for most of the waveforms we care about. So the remaining term here is this mean square bandwidth. Mean square bandwidth is the second moment of the energy spectrum, so G being the Fourier transform of the time domain signal. So it's inversely proportional to the mean square bandwidth, so we want to maximize that in order to get to a good um, range estimate. So what does that look like? So our variance now um, inversely proportional to signal to noise ratio times our mean square bandwidth. What that's telling us to maximize this, this is the second moment. So to maximize it, we want to concentrate all the energy into the side bands of a given bandwidth. So a linear frequency modulated waveform might have a uniform bandwidth, just as just a signal over an arbitrary variable, which represents uh, uh, frequency in this case. Linear frequency modulated waveform has a uniform bandwidth. What we're doing is concentrating that energy into the side bands of that, um, that same bandwidth. Um, so in comparison, if we look at an LFM and a two-tone waveform, we have something like this, you know, same overall bandwidth, but now we've just got two tones. This affords us much better um, delay estimation accuracy. Delay estimation is range estimation. So we can get to a better range estimation accuracy, but it also has some hardware benefits or implementation benefits, which we'll talk about. One of the challenges with this type of waveform is in the uh, range ambiguities. So when we perform a match filter operation on our linear frequency modulated waveform, we get a nice sort of sync function response, nice main lobe. And then we have these, these side lobes which are very low, so we can differentiate our main lobe um, pretty well. The two-tone waveform, so this is just an example here to show the difference, two-tone waveform is narrower, so it has better accuracy, but you can see it has a large number of ambiguities. Now, we wouldn't use this two-tone two -tone waveform in a typical radar operation because that would be sending it out to uh, some unknown target. It's going to have a lot of scattering centers. It's going to come back, and you can have all these ambiguities on top of one another. You're not going to be able to discern anything. But in our case, we have a cooperative system. We're sending out a signal to one of the other nodes. That node is going to retransmit it with gain back to our signal, we're going to have a nice point source like response. So we can, um, so we're not going to have ambiguities falling on top of one another. We are going to have an ambiguous response, but we have ways to disambiguate this response. Um, some of these things, some of these ways are by adding a little bit of modulation onto these signals, which will taper the other, the other um, ambiguities. I'll talk about a step frequency waveform later that we use for scalability that has the um, added benefit of notching out some of these additional lobes. There are various ways that we can do that. Once we've isolated or determined what lobe we're on, we can track it, um, for example. Um, and, um, and so once we've disambiguated it, we get um, the unambiguous um, uh, range measurement with the same accuracy of this two-tone waveform. So we move forward with this two-tone waveform. Let's see what we can do in terms of uh, ranging measurements. Implemented this just in a um, laboratory uh, environment. So we have some um, uh, an arbitrary waveform generator, wideband arbitrary waveform generator, sending out a two-tone signal. Um, we're um, reflecting it just off the corner reflector in this case, representing another node actively retransmitting it, which is what we use in our current systems uh, as an active retransmitter. Uh, we're receiving it and then we're sampling that on a, a high-speed digitizer. So this just shows the system here in the laboratory. Um, so on the right, we have our, our lower bound. And I've drawn some lines here to show what a tenth of a wavelength um, at different frequencies is. Um, this is the tone separation. Um, so 200 megahertz, 300 megahertz, 400 megahertz. You can see we're getting down to the millimeter type range. SNR here is 16 dB. Um, which is, um, you know, from a radar perspective, is, is kind of on par with kind of what we'd like to see for a high probability detection. But again, this is not a one over R to the fourth dependence. We're sending out a signal, and it's going to be actively retransmitted from the signal from the other node. So we can actually get to very appreciable signal to noise ratios with, the, with this type of cooperative system. Um, so we're doing pretty well here. We're getting down to this, you know, you know, tenth of a wavelength at 10 gigahertz. You know, we want 15th of a wavelength at whatever frequency we want to operate at. So this type of waveform here is definitely going to support in the in the gigahertz range. Um, the, cha the challenge with this is we're using this wideband arbitrary waveform generator. 
we've got an ADC, you know, it's 1.25 giga samples per second. We're sending out 500 megahertz waveforms, so we're sampling at a really high rate. We really don't want to do that in a practical system. We want to put this onto things like UAVs and other platforms. We can't have these really high speed digitizers um, and wideband um, wide systems. So this is where another benefit of the spectral sparsity of the waveform comes in. We're only sending out two tones. We're not using any of the bandwidth in between. We don't have to generate a 500 megahertz band, uh, bandwidth signal. We only have to generate these two tones separated by 500 megahertz. So using that concept, we implemented this in uh, just a commercial software defined radio. This is a um, Edis USRP X310 um, software defined radio. It's got an operational bandwidth of six gigahertz, but channelized each, each channel here um, is 160 megahertz, but we're only using about 10 megahertz of bandwidth um, and uh, for this, for this uh, system here, but the, even that is, is well more than what we need. So what we do is we generate our two baseband signals. We upconvert those to different carrier frequencies, combine them in the air, transmit them, receive them. We are, each, each receiver then sees both those two tones, but it only down converts the relevant tone. So it's only digitizing a single tone. So we very low rate digitizer in this case. We sample them, we digitally reconstruct them to their separation in the air, perform the match filtering, and we get to uh, accuracies commensurate with what we had in the air. This is our, our CRB, our SNR was kind of varying in this measurement. Um, and this is a standard deviation of our measurement. So we're actually getting um, sub milliseconds, um, or, or sorry, sub millimeter ranging accuracy with this, um, this commercial software defined radio system. Again, 400, uh, 450 megahertz tone separation on the system, but instantaneously we're only using, you know, you know, less than a megahertz of bandwidth. These are just tones that we're sending out. So this is a waveform that you could potentially add on to, the, to existing waveform, just the ends of the bands, just pair those two off and you get this nice ranging accuracy out of it. So we're getting to micrometer level ranging accuracy, which is, which is well above what we need for microwave systems, getting into supporting um, um, ranging accuracy to support millimeter wave uh, frequency beamforming. Um, the other important thing about this is it's only bandwidth dependent. So the carrier frequency that we use for this can, can really be anything. You know, there's limitations on, you know, if it's really low frequency on whether there's differences in your transceivers at the two tones. Um, maybe you have, a, you know, additional dispersion in some of the systems if you've got a really wide fractional bandwidth. But you can put this carrier frequency uh, anywhere. We've, we've demonstrated it, you know, here in the six gigahertz range, we've done it at W band. Um, uh, we've done it at, four, at, um, at uh, 20 and 40, you know, 20, 40 gigahertz range. So it's really only bandwidth dependent. Um, so that's another nice benefit of, of, the, of the waveform. Okay, so that's ranging. So this gets us to a point where we can estimate the separations between the platforms with an accuracy that will support the phase correction so we can do beam steering. So now we have to make sure that the frequencies are aligned uh, for beam steering operation. So there are various ways that we can do the frequency synchronization. Um, and there are techniques in the literature that use two-way transmission. So each node will kind of transmit their frequency reference. They will kind of compare the two and then they can update theirs based on the difference. What we wanted to do was look at um, two things. One, could we do more of a one-way transmission, just kind of transmitting a signal to the other. We were thinking of this more like how in the lab, we connect the 10 megahertz out to the 10 megahertz in of another system. We'd like to have something like that that doesn't require any processing. We want to keep it as physical layer as we can so there's no latencies. So as we talked about, latencies can have a big impact um, uh, because of the update time. And if we have a completely physical layer solution, we have the ability to run this uh, completely continuously if we'd like. Um, we also want to use the spectral sparsity of this system. Um, we're already sending out a signal that's got, just got two tones. So is that something we can use? And the architecture we came up with was to use, and it turns out we weren't the only ones um, um, to kind of uh, look at this type of system, but at, at the time we, did, we didn't know about the other systems that did it. But what we're doing is basically sending out a, our two-tone signal. So imagine we're separating it by 10 megahertz in this case. We receive that signal and do a little bit of signal conditioning and then mix it against itself. And basically um, when we get the down conversion, we're going to get the 10 megahertz reference or 10 megahertz signal, the beat frequency some higher order harmonics that, we're, that will filter out, then we're just left with that 10 megahertz signal. The nice thing about this is, again, we're already sending out two tones. If 10 megahertz is what we need for ranging, we can also use it for frequency transfer. 
And this is a completely physical or completely analog solution. So we just run this signal into the phase lock loop of our software to find radios in our case, and it just locks the oscillators, which works really well. If we want to get to a wider tone separation, I was talking about hundreds of megahertz separation, what we can do is add that 10 megahertz onto one of those tones, basically modulate one of those tones with that 10 megahertz. This circuit doesn't have to change. It's still going to give you the beat frequencies of all these different tones, but we're only retaining the 10 megahertz beat frequencies, a uh, beat frequency. And so all the other ones get, get filtered out here. The other benefit of this is the second moment of this spectrum here is, is still largely maximized. The difference between the difference of the mean squared bandwidth between this signal and one that has just a single tone here is, is pretty negligible once this um, separation is, is you know, much larger than the modulation bandwidth. So you really can't have a joint waveform that does frequency transfer and ranging without one impacting the other. So we've implemented this as just showing a connectorized version, but we've implemented it in various forms. Um, just showing the outputs of you know two systems uh, reference uh, oscillator and the lock oscillator. So so this works really well to do the frequency synchronization. So these are two of the principal um, uh, techniques that we use to do to implement phase coordination um, uh, for distributed beam forming. So we wanted to to use these to see if we could do um, some first order open loop distributed beam forming operations. So this first one I'm showing is um, only using ranging in this case. So as I mentioned, internode range estimation is, is the hardest thing um, to implement, our hardest thing to implement in a distributed phased array. And so what we did here was had two one gigahertz continuous wave oscillators. We locked the oscillator. So in this case, we just had a cable running between them. We just wanted to see what the ranging system could do. Transmitting one gigahertz um, continuous wave signal, and then we had a target. Our target was just a, spec a spectrum analyzer, so we're just looking at the received power. This was about this was a half kilometer away. We moved to the second node at a bit of an angle. This allowed us to get a difference in downrange uh, without occluding the transmitter, the second transmitter, um, and it allowed us to go through uh, would allow us to go through a number of cycles of uh, coherence and decoherence of those two continuous wave signals. So on the right, I'm showing you the measurement from that. So this black line is if we don't do anything, um, we get a destructive interference, constructive interference as we'd expect. As we move that node, it's past, it's gradually pushing that sign, that second sign wave forward. So we're going to get destructive interference when they're out of phase. Turn on our ranging system, and that's what's shown in the blue line here. And it maintains that steered beam throughout the throughout the motion. We checked this with a laser range finder and implemented, you know, basically manually updated the phase. That's what this red line is showing. You can see it lands right on top of it. So this is really exciting. This is, this is the first, um, you know, open loop system that was doing beam forming as we were removing one of these nodes. Again, no feedback during this from the tartar, just monitoring the power. Um, so this is really exciting. We also tried to steer a null. Um, Null steering is much, much harder than beam steering, particularly in distributed phased arrays. Um, with two elements, it's kind of feasible. And that's what we've seen here. We got about 15 dB nulling. As soon as we add more elements, any little phase error tends to kill the null. So nulling is really hard to do. But with two elements here, you can see we got to you know, pretty good null forming. Um, so this is a pretty exciting measurement because it shows that a ranging system um, was you know, feasible, you know, could feasibly support um, the estimation and correction of the phase due to motion of the platforms um, without any feedback from the destination. So from this, we built on this, and then we implemented ranging and frequency transfer in the system. Uh, this one was also just with rack mount equip equipment, so you know, uh, arbitrary waveform generators, signal generators, uh, things like that. Um, so this uh, system that I'm showing you here is fully wireless. It's doing ranging, it's doing frequency transfer, completely wireless between them. It's all implemented in software-defined radio, um, including our, you know, our adjunct circuitry that we've built for the frequency locking. Um, now, in this case, we're moving the, the secondary node over one cycle of what we would see on the rotation of the carrier uh, frequency. But what we see is we get two nulls when we do this. The reason we get two nulls is not only we're moving the transmit um, node, so the transmit antenna is moving, but so it's, so it's got a phase shift. But the frequency signal that we're transmitting, that antenna is also moving. So we get that phase shift twice. So we have twice the, twice the phase rotation. Um, we're already measuring this distance down to well below the accuracies that we need. So we can easily correct it. We just multiply it by two. But that's why we get two cycles of phase rotation uh, in this one. 
even though we're going, only go, going over one cycle of displacement relative to the wavelength. So we turn on our ranging system, um, and that's what the blue line shows here. And you can see we're well above that 90% um, uh, uh, metric that we're after to get to um, high coherent gain. So again, this was this was another exciting measurement for us. Um, first, you know, fully wireless distributed beam forming system, completely open loop, just measuring the power at the receiver. So these are a couple of demonstrations of the, the fundamental technology enabling the space coherence between systems. As I mentioned, there's, there's a number of um, fundamental aspects, phase, frequency, and time that we have to implement. Um, and there are challenges on top of that. What I wanted to talk about before we get into um, uh, the radiation aspects and some of the uh, or some of the additional challenges are some things that you can do with distributed beam forming if you have less coordination. So let's say, for example, we've only got a receive side distributed array. Um, there are various things that we can do with receive side distributed um, coordination. Um, in some cases, you don't need to have any coordination between them. If you have enough processing behind them, you can, you can eventually cohere the signals. But if, if we have, for example, a number of elements and they are, um, they are frequency locked, so they're all in the same reference or they're all in the same frequency reference, uh, what we can do is capture signals from an emitter, um, estimate the phase difference between those signals, and then quite easily correct those phases, adjust those phases to get to a coherence or receive side beam forming operation. So that's what's shown here. It's just something we did um, with one of our systems. Um, very straightforward, just estimating the phases and then correcting it. Um, it's only on receive side, and again, it requires additional processing. So in the amount of processing that it takes depends on the waveform, depends on the coordination between the platforms, but it is feasibly on receive, there's, there's quite a bit more you can do. The transmit side really is a more challenging one. There's another uh, topology that we were interested in exploring, which was a, a repeater-based um, uh, distributed beam former. Um, this one's a little bit different in that we've got a transmitter that's just free running. We've got a repeater here that's measuring its distance to this transmitter, collecting that transmitted signal, and then boosting it to the target. So we have to know the angle in this case. But once we know that, we don't need to know anything else other than the range to this transmitter because we're collecting it. And in this case, we are just running it through, um, running it through uh, a loop, adding a phase shift, and then retransmitting it. We don't have to up convert. We don't have to down convert, demodulate, or anything like that. It's all, all analog. And so, what we did with this was show that, show that we could transmit at one frequency, collect the signal, and then retransmit it, and either in either tra retransmit in phase to boost the signal, or, or out of phase to kind of null the signal. We transmitted communications waveform with this. When we boost the signal, our bit error rate goes down considerably. And so this is um, 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 uh, the bit error rate we want to be lower, the number of bit errors we get on our communication signal. So when it's low, it's very good. Red line is with a single one, so we boosted it quite a bit. Rotate it to 180 degrees, and it basically completely mixes up the, the information. So you're kind of getting a signal through here, but the information is unrecoverable. So the nice thing about this, again, it's completely unconnected. The transmitter, do, transmitter doesn't even know that this repeater is there, completely unconnected. Um, based only on the ranging in this case, um, uh, uh, again, you have to know the angle, but also based on, only on the ranging of the technology that we've been talking about so far. Okay, so I want to, yeah, I want to pause there for a second. Sorry, uh, uh, Tom, I'm going to get into some application-specific challenges. I'll talk about some things there and some new opportunities there, but. Um, uh, uh, if there are questions at this point, I'm happy to take it too. Uh, Tom, and I'm sorry to interrupt. Oh, no, that's, that's what I was going to suggest. Uh, so, folks, uh, if you'd like to ask a question, if you can find the reaction button and just raise your hand. Um, I'm not seeing any, but I, I had a question. Um, this is fascinating. Uh, and, uh, oh, I see Jay has a question, has raised his hand. Let's go ahead and. Ask Jay to unmute and go ahead and ask your question, Jay. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Oh, okay. Um, hey, that's very interesting uh, talk so far. So, if the, this uh, frequency reference made by a difference of two two tones, if you have multiple, if a a node is listening to m multiple other uh, arrays. How do you distinguish which one you're listening to and who decides what tone to lock to? Is there a rough one tone to rule them all, all or do they all kind of figure figure that out? 
That's an excellent question. Um, that gets into the scalability concern. And I'm going to talk about that in a second. But um, the, the topology that I showed earlier, where we've got um, a frequency reference and we're distributing it to another node that's collecting it, that's what we call a centralized architecture. So we have a primary node that would be transferring to secondary nodes. Those secondary nodes would have to know they're getting it from a certain primary. That's that's uh, that's got more of a tree architecture, so you can argue that it may have single it has points of failure, and so what I'll talk about in a couple of slides is a decentralized architecture. It's more on the signal processing type of side, um, but it, it is a different uh, different way of doing the frequency transfer that's more robust to interference. Oh, you're muted. I think if you're asking something else. Oh um, yeah, I. So uh, let's say you're in a passive receiving mode. Is, is the idea that you might um, have a, a beacon, so to speak, to get the distributed elements to cohere and then like you know, like, so, so so I guess I'm asking about the remote sensing situation and, and like I'm trying to get a sense of where you're going and then, you know, the difference tone, I think you can get this difference tone extremely accurate, which is uh, really clever. And so, uh, but then, uh, you know, I was just fascinating that on the receive side, you know, you don't need much because you can also use just you know, some statistics on the signal, if you know something about the signal. And, and one of the things that comes to mind actually is uh, instead of CW signals with very specific tone separation, you know, in packet-based communication systems, we have a preamble and of a known, you know, bit sequence. And a lot of times correlations used around that. Yeah. Um, so maybe that's a second question, you know, uh, but the first question is really like, yeah, like if you wanted to make a, an Uber, RX remote sensing array, would it be that you would have a beacon and then your array is listening to that and then they would go ahead and, you know, get their, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure how that, would, I guess you're saying, I just, I'm not sure how that would all play out. And I'm, I'm just sure. sort of curious. Yeah. yeah so I'm asking a very good question, but I'm just sort of feeling my way into this is very cool. Yeah, no, no, no. That's those. Those are great questions. Um, if if we're looking at, um, so I I've been talking a lot about sort of an active system. We're transmitting a signal, um, and we have transmit coherence, and if we could transmit coherence, we can do receive coherence. But if we're just doing the receive side, um, the if we got a passive remote sensor, for example, or radiometers, um, we want it to be on the same frequency. We want it to be looking at the same target, and then they have to be time aligned. Um, if we're doing something like a interferometric operation, so, and I'll talk about interferometric imaging later, we also have to know their positions. So those are all the basic, the same basic things we've been talking about. It's just the, the information is going to get aggregated somewhere, but that it, basic information has to be known when those signals come in, if you're going to process them coherently. So we still have to know their positions. They still have to be frequency locks. They still have to be time aligned. Now, some of those frequency locking time alignment you can get by um, potentially um, with some post-processing. So if, you, if you're familiar with like two-pass SAR interferometry, for example, you know, they, they have a whole lot of post-processing that they do to cohere multiple measurements to correct phase rotations and gradients and, you know, things like that, that I'm, I'm, not, I'm not an expert in, but I know that they have a, a number of sophisticated tech, uh, techniques that they do. So once you have the signals, if you have enough processing, you have enough time, you know about the signals, there's a lot you can do on the signal processing side. Um, uh, depending on the type of operational, there's still some things that would have to happen sort of in situ, I think. Um, what, we're, what we're trying to do, uh, what, more of what we're trying to do is on the sort of transmit side so we can do a radar type operation because if we feel if we can do that, we can encompass pretty much any wireless operation, active or passive. So your second question, I think, was on more like this type of topology, which is on, um, uh, it's kind of a related question, I think, but, you know, how do you, how would you cohere things if you have, you know, do you have a beacon and something like that? Uh, certainly, if you do have a beacon, if you know uh, something about the signal coming in, it makes that receive side processing a lot easier. So in this case, we knew we were getting a pulse CW signal in or just estimating 
its phase and then we're correcting the phase we can sum it and then you know we don't do anything our black line shows the sum signal it's, it's not very good but you know just estimating the phases and correcting them we get a nice beam form signal so knowing something about that signal coming in certainly is a benefit uh Daniel, it, okay so there's a question from yeah. daniel yes hi uh thank you very much for the uh taking my question is in urban environments uh, they're often characterized by having large a powerful uh, transmitters in the environment can um, any of those transmitters be used to minimize the required communication between the uh, elements of the array or maybe even speed up the uh, location um, the relative location finding of the elements by utilizing third party uh, transmitters is that something that's uh, way off off uh, left field or is that something that might be fruitful no actually that's that's a hybrid approach between the closed loop and open loop system so even if you've got non-cooperative feedback even if you've got a system that's transmitting and it's high power you can use that to help cohere your system together um and so in that sort of hybrid tech in that sort of hybrid topology, um, yeah, if you've got external signals, it's something you can use to start the coherent process. Um, it doesn't get you everything if you've just got, if you're just using that beacon signal, but if you're using that in conjunction with the technologies we're showing here, there are ways I think that um, it could it could benefit that. So um, yeah, that's a mix between the closed loop and open loop. Something we've, we've investigated, we've looked at in various ways. Um, we've just kind of, you know, pushed down the open loop path more, more rigorously. But that's a very good question. Okay, any other questions? Uh, looks like we're ready to move on, I think. Okay. So I've got a, a few more slides. I wanna talk um, a little bit about some application specific challenges that, that we've seen um, kind of come up in the course of our research and um, that our sponsors have kind of um, talked with us about. And so some directions, research directions we've gone in to address those. Um, and then I want to talk about some of the new research directions that we've kind of seen that have come out of this um, distributed array concept. You know, they're, they're leveraging aspects of distributed arrays in different ways, and some of them are, are, are using those technologies in sort of spin-off ways, but I'm going to talk about those uh, as well. So a lot of the um, challenges besides the fundamental challenges as i mentioned tend to get a little application specific you know where are you using them what is the environment uh, what types of platforms are they on um you know do you have to worry about things like rotation of the platforms with in which case you have to care about polarization of the antennas and things like that um so one of the first things we we're interested in is what happens if the environment's changing we know we can get good range accuracy we know it's snr dependent and so um, what happens if the environment's changing? The nodes are separating further apart. We have weather conditions that are going to degrade, um, that are going to degrade the ranging accuracy. How can we adjust to that? The second one that we're interested in is scalability. You know, we have technologies that can work between, you know, two nodes. Um, we're going to show how we get to more than those, those nodes. So these are some of the principal challenges we've also been looking into. So on the adaptability side, we leverage here again when we're talking about range accuracy the spectral sparsity of the waveform we've got two parameters of this waveform we can adjust signal to noise ratio if we're able to do if we're able to do that um, and the tone separation because it's spectrally sparse we're sep we're just generating those two tones and in our system we're generating it on two separate up converters and down converters we can locate those at any separation we want so we have flexibility to move those around this also helps if there's something like interference or transmitting in a band and there happens to be other things in the band that are interfering with those signals, we can move those out of, out of, out of that band um, uh, to adjust to that. So what we implemented was an adaptive system. It's uh, uh, based on a control loop where we're sending out our two-tone waveform, goes out, reflects back, and we, um, we receive it. And then we estimate how well we're doing our range accuracy. We've looked at various ways of doing this. But basically, we're looking at either SNR estimation or the, the, the standard deviation of a range estimates. What this is doing is allowing us to see how well in situ we're measuring that range. We, we have a really good sense of where we have to be along that CRB curve in order to, or the, the lower bound curve in order to get to the accuracies that we need for a given frequency. So we can monitor, in re, monitor it in real time and adjust that tone separation to account for any degradation in the estimation accuracy. 
So we implemented the system, again, software defined radios. We put it um, outside on the roof of uh, our engineering building here at Michigan State, about 100 meters apart. Um, and we just let it run for days at a time, sometimes weeks at a time. What I'm showing here is the variation in SNR. This is just over, a, I think, a 24 hour period in this case, but we did run it for up to uh, seven days continuously. Um, so variation in SNR. Um, this is wind speed, just to show that, you know, some motion of the platforms. There's also rain. This doesn't show the rain in it, but we had some rain conditions as well. So this is the frequency of the second tone, the separation. We're only looking up to about eight megahertz, just to prove eight megahertz tone separation, just to prove on the concept here. So you can see that the tone separation increases as the SNR decreases. And so this is basically adjusting the wider the tone separation, the better our accuracy. So our SNR goes down, the tones adjust to, to account for that. When the um, SNR is low, we got these high wind conditions. Um, the, the tone separation is increasing to compensate for that. We had a limit here of, I think, seven and a half megahertz just based on what we said it. So it kind of truncates here. But as you can see, it pretty much adaptively uh, adjusts to it. What's shown here is the uh, beam forming frequency that would be supported by this range. You can see, although that the, the SNR is moving around very appreciably, and if we didn't correct for it, the commensurate frequency would also be degrading appreciably, but you can see it's almost constant. Um, this is at three different levels of coherent gain, 70%, 80%, 90%, the different frequencies that it would support. And you know, we're in the gigahertz range here. So this adaptive framework is something that um, is, is uh, very, uh, very flexible. Um, and, and does provide very robust uh, correction uh, of the ranging accuracy in these environments. Second thing um, is scalability. Um, the first way we looked at this, again, using spectral sparsity, was looking at a time and frequency domain uh, multiplexing. Um, and the nice thing about this is we can, we can basically send out a, in this case, we kind of looked like a stepped frequency two-tone waveform. Um, it doesn't degrade the ranging accuracy. We're still looking at just these, these two tones when we're doing the processing, but we can sequence these steps to match a certain connection. And the nice thing about that is when we do the match filtering, there's almost no interference between them, even when they're overlapping. And we ran these with multiple nodes, you know, completely free running. There's no time synchronization between them, and there was no degradation in the ranging accuracy. We implemented this. Um, um, with and this, this supports something like n factorial, you know, number of steps. So you can go to a pretty large number of connections per node. Um, but as I mentioned in a second, we really don't need to go to, you know, an arbitrarily large number of connections per node. Something around 10 or 20 is probably going to be um, good for a distributed architecture, which I'll discuss next. But we implemented this, this waveform um, just to show that we could do this with more than, you know, more than two nodes. So we got three nodes here. Um, uh, two of them are secondary nodes. So our first one um, is acting as a repeater. These two are sending out a signal. It's, it's, re, it's repeating off of, oh, sorry, here's a primary node. Um, these two are sending out a signal. It's repeating from the primary, primary node. The secondary nodes are doing the match filtering process, estimating that distance, correcting the phase to that primary node as it's moving. And so we, we get a null here if we don't do anything. And you can see we get um, a very high coherent gain as we, as we update it. And so, so here's the three signal levels down here. So you can see we're, we're um, doing very well on our beam forming gain there. So this is a nice scalable architecture that again, doesn't degrade the ranging accuracy. It's another one we could use the frequency transfer uh, on top of because we're still sending two tones. Um, but what we wanted to do was look at an architecture that would give us uh, more of an arbitrary scalability. And so we started looking at uh, decentralized um, consensus-based um, architectures. And so this gets to the other question about the frequency transfer. You know, rather than a centralized topology, we'd really like something that's decentralized. We don't really want single points of failure in the system. And so this type of architecture allows us to do that. The way that this um, decentralized consensus averaging works is nodes transmit their frequency reference to neighboring nodes, and, and they receive the frequency reference from their neighboring nodes. And then they calculate the average of those frequencies, update their own frequency to that average. As long as the network is connected over time, um, is, as long as it's strongly connected over time, that um, array will converge to a global average within the limits of the dynamics of the system. So if you're updating very infrequently and you have very noisy oscillators, it won't converge. So it has to update within um, certain parameters. But what we found is that update iterations on the order of 
second or less, you know, um, millisecond range again uh, for quartz crystal oscillators will allow these networks to converge with arbitrary numbers of, of elements. Um, so this is modeling uh, of that shown here. We implemented this in a, in a test bed of just a small number of um, uh, low cost nodes. These are just transmitting frequencies and estimating them. You can see it converges to, um, converges to a small residual frequency. These were actually had discretized frequency references. So we couldn't get to the exact state, but we were within the discretization level of the nodes. And again, supports a very high level of coherent beam forming. So this architecture we've used, this is for frequency transfer. We've used it for other, um, uh, for phase uh, alignment as well within the system. And we have some papers um, that just came out this year on using this, uh, uh, this technology or using this approach to do um, uh, multiple electrical state coordination. So it's a really powerful approach. I think it's gonna be um, uh, really useful for uh, distributed phase array systems. So just a couple of the challenges, adaptability, scalability. Uh, what I wanna talk about um, in the remaining few slides is on using some of the aspects of distributed phase arrays for new types of measurements and some new research directions. So a lot of this comes from the fact that distributed phase arrays are inherently sparse, which means, and when they're a phase coherent operation, they're gonna have grading loads. So if we just have two elements, we might be sending a signal to a receiver, but if it's electrically large, if it's got an electrically large separation, we're gonna be sending grading loads in a lot of other directions. The number of grading loads depends on the baseline. So the further away they are, we are, the more grading loads there, they're gonna be. Usually we look at these and we say, grading loads are, are not so good. We want to get rid of those. Um, so what will we look at? Nulling perhaps, if we you know we've got a target over here, maybe we want to null it. As I mentioned earlier, nulling is really hard in a distributed phase array. Um, you got 10 nodes, they're beam forming to a direction. If one of them is off in a, a little, by a little bit, that's fine. You still have the other nine that are beam forming. If you're null forming, you're counting on cancellation of those signals. If even one of those isn't canceling, then you, your, your null is ruined. So null forming is really hard. Um, the other way we can look at it is implementing bandwidth. So as you implement bandwidth, these grading lobes will move as a function of angle. So with a wide enough bandwidth, they'll, they'll tend to average out, average down. And that's what's shown here. The, the problem is you need a pretty wide bandwidth for that to happen. When these are really widely separated, you really can't get rid of the grading lobes in and around the main beam without it, you know, absurdly large bandwidth. So in, impractical bandwidths. So we looked at that, um, you know, we, we came up with some ways, you know, looking at dynamics in the system and motion of the system and bandwidth, um, looking at sort of a space bandwidth product um, to actually, you know, push the side lobes, the grading lobes down, um, at least within a certain, you know, leaving a certain number around the main beam that were feasible for certain bandwidths, certain systems, certain dynamics. But we were looking at that and thinking these grading lobes are there, they're really hard to get rid of, you know, potentially they can be useful for something. So we're looking at different ways that we can use the spatial diversity of the system and these grading lobes uh, to do different types of measurements. So the first one was looking at if we've got a static array, you know, these grading lobes are out in space and I've got a dynamic target moving through it, what we can do in terms of radar type measurements. So radar normally measures range, range rate or Doppler and angle. And so what we looked at is that if we've got a target that's moving through a grading lobe pattern of this um, interferometer, what that's going to do is trace out an oscillation on the output of this. It's going to have a voltage oscillation if we process it correctly. And in this case, we're uh, correlating it, multiplying it, and then integrating. So we correlate those two. Target moves through it angularly, traces out an oscillation. The frequency of that oscillation is directly proportional to the angular velocity of that target. So if we do a frequency estimation on it, we've got a direct measurement of the angular velocity of the target. So now our radar can measure range, range rate, angle, angular, angle rate, basically instantaneously. I mean, it depends on the motion of the target, but there's no tracking or, or uh, angle estimation associated with it. So really is sort of a fourth uh, sort of basic radar measurement. So we, we've implemented this in various forms for various things. It's just showing uh, just um, motion of a person walking towards the radar. We get a Doppler shift, you know, inter interferom interferometric shift moving angularly to the radar. There's almost no Doppler shift and we get an angular shift and then sort of at a 45 degree trajectory, which is about like this, and then we get a shift on both of them. So it really is a complementary velocity measurement, allows us to get multi-dimensional velocity measurements instantaneously in a radar. So we've used this for automotive uh, sensing, for human computer interaction, gesture sensing, and a number of things. But again, leveraging the grading loads of this, of this sparse array. So these grading lobes are there. Um, they're going to be there if we have a large number of elements in our distributed array. Let's say they're UAVs. 
Um, and we've got a large number of baselines and they've all got different grading load patterns. We wanted to look at how that could potentially, could potentially be used for sensing. Um, so if we want to just steer one beam and raster scan it, that's something we could potentially do. But if we've got a lot of other grading loads, then ambiguities might be a problem. So what it turns out is we can use a technique that um, uh, was originally developed in radio astronomy. We've adapted it to an act. So radio astronomy are completely passive um, and um, passive millimeter array of imagers that you see for like contraband detection, completely passive. We um, um, modified this type of uh, modified this type of imaging to a new approach where we're actually transmitting noise signals. We have to care. We have to be careful about how these noise signals are generated, where they're located, how they're transmitted, what their bandwidth is relative to what we're trying to do. But we've uh, determined how that can happen so that it mimics the appropriate radiation to perform this type of imaging. And so, what we can do um, from that then is generate a sparse array which could be our UAVs floating around or coherently coordinated. When we cross correlate the outputs of the received signals from any pair in that array, the grading load pattern um, matches to a spatial frequency. And that spatial frequency is basically the, you know, the, in, the Fourier transform of the spatial domain. So if we collect enough spatial frequency samples, we can do an inverse Fourier transform, we can form an image. So we looked at this, we demonstrated it in a, a 40 gigahertz system that we could do this type of active incoherence uh, interferometric imaging, we call it active inter, inter, incoherent uh, millimeter wave imaging. Um, but the processing is really straightforward. It's just an inverse Fourier transform. So it can happen really, really quickly. So uh, what we did is basically built up a faster you know, processing backend. It's just, I mean, it's just a computer, a GPU in this case, there was nothing fancy about it, but we ran the processing in, in parallel and we were able to get to really high speed image reconstruction, 650 frames per second, which was more than 30 times faster than any millimeter wave imaging system in the literature. Um, so we're showing a point target here, but we have a paper where we've actually got a high speed video of this moving. And it's, it's, it's really, it was, it was pretty exciting when we, first, when we first got that implemented. But again, this is leveraging the spatial sparsity. We have these grading lobes there, they're already gonna be there. So we can use those for, to do things like really, really fast imaging. So this is sort of an outcome of, uh, looking at the the um, uh, architecture of this distributed array and what we can do with it. So those are the grading lobes. Another aspect of these distributed arrays that we can look at are the platforms that they're in motion. They're moving around, so we can actually use their motion to do interesting things. And so what we started looking at is dynamics in systems. Um, so I mentioned, you know, as if we change the bandwidth, these grading lobes are going to move. But if we change the position, the grading lobes will also move. And so if we have two elements and they're relative, moving relative to one another in a, in, a, in a certain pattern, a certain velocity in a certain pattern, we can implement a differential um, uh, a grading load pattern at different angles that will add a different amplitude and phase modulation onto the signal. So for transmitting a communication signal in the main beam, it's unaffected. In the side lobes, we're adding additional phase and amplitude modulation on it. So it's, it's a directional modulation. And it's based on a new degree of freedom, which is motion of the platform. Um, and so it doesn't degrade the, the, the gain. So normally, when we do directional modulation, we have to give up main beam gain to get an additional degree of freedom. In this case, we don't have to do that. So we implemented this in a system. We got a two element transmitter here, um, ranging between them. So our distributed, you know, coherent ranging system. And what this shows here is the bit error, um, bit error ratio of our, our, of our um, uh, transmitted signal uh, from this system, um, modeling and simulation and measurement. So here's our measurement, our, our green line. So we get a really low errors in the middle. So this is like where we're sending the information. We're sending grading lobes in all these other directions. Energy is going in all the other directions, but the information is unrecoverable. All we're doing is moving the platforms with a specific rate, adds that modulation on it. So it's a really interesting way of using the dynamics in the system to do um, uh, secure wireless uh, operations. Um, I'm not going to dwell on this, but we can do angle estimation using the dynamics as well. Um, and um, the last thing I'll show is using uh, dynamics to dynamics combine, array dynamics combined with the Fourier transform or Fourier um, imaging to do imageless objects. Um, characterization. So in this case, we're taking this grading load pattern and, and spinning it. Basically, if we spin our array. What that does is traces out a ring in the spatial frequency domain. Turns out specific targets, if they have sharp edges, create very 
distinct artifacts in the spatial frequency domain. So we can create a ring filter with our dynamic array. We can detect these artifacts. We can determine what targets are on the scene. We never have to image them. So again, this is based on sparsity of the array and the dynamics of the system. So it's really very um, uh, exciting, exciting direction using using the spec using the sparsity of the array, using the dynamics in the array. We think there's a lot of really interesting research that can come out of that. Okay, so I'm going to wrap up here. I'll take more questions in a minute. Um, you know what I what I wanted to show in this talk is that you know. Distributed phase arrays certainly are challenging, but we're addressing a lot of the fundamental challenges that exist. And so the first steps along the way, um, you know, solutions exist. Um, there are secondary challenges. We've started looking at some of those. There's no shortage of secondary challenges uh, to be addressed, um, but we have these sort of fundamental ones in place. We think that there's um, a lot of opportunity for the secondary challenges going forward. And again, the sort of unique nature of these distributed phase arrays separated in time and moving, um, there's a lot of potential for for interesting research. Um, so um, so I hope that um, hope that you've you, you come away with with kind of these points here. I do want to thank my my research team, my students, and my postdocs are are outstanding. They do awesome work. Um, I have a really great group. Um, couldn't have done this uh, this work without them. Um, so I do want to thank all my students and and my postdocs. I want to thank our sponsors. We have a, an excellent set of sponsors who have been very supportive of this research. Um, and finally, I want to thank you for listening. I really appreciate uh, the opportunity to be here virtually with you. Um, I hope to see many of you in person at IMS. Um, I'll be there in Denver. Um, and so, you know, please, if, if uh, you want to chat, please, you know, look for me there. Um, but again, I thank you. Thank you for listening. And I'm, I'm happy to take more questions at this point. Oh, Professor, thank you very much. Uh, so it's really um, on inspiring. Uh, talk. I, I, I just want to. I had a question um, just for clarification. So uh, the grading lobe exploitation, where you're modulating, you're, modu you're, you're you're mechanically modulating the distance between array elements. Is that right? So here we're showing mechanical modulation. <clears throat> yeah, so you can do it in two ways. You can do mechanical, uh, basically physical modulation, spatial modulation, as, as we're calling it. You can do frequency modulation, which is what, what we're doing here, or you can do both. Um, and we have looked at both. Um, so you can you can change the frequency, you can change the position. What you're doing is changing the electrical separation of the platforms. Um, what we wanted right. to do with this one was only change the spatial aspects so that the signal we're transmitting is it, it's independent of the, it's independent of it's independent of the signal that we're transmitting, so unaffected. But you do have the flexibility to change that waveform as well. So I'm just curious, is that fundamental or could that be, in other words, does this technique, you know, that uh, creates the picture on the left, uh, is that fundamentally have to be mechanical or could you convert that to an electrical implementation with enough head scratching you know like yeah I don't so know, like if, if for transmission example, line I don't know. yeah so if for example you had like a, you've probably seen time modulated arrays um if you have something like that no you're, you're switching well so basically you've got a series of elements and you're switching some of them on and off so you can kind of like switch the one okay you know something like that ah, right 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 yeah, yeah. So people have investigated um, those types of arrays for directional modulation, similar um, uh, topic as what we're what we're showing here. So that's something that's definitely feasible. Uh, the difference there, though, is as soon as you start switching elements off, you reduce your gain. We yep. this technique here does not reduce the gain at all. You're always transmitting right. at maximum gain. So your main beam here is completely unaffected. So the other directional modulation techniques in order to get to an additional degree of freedom that allows you to add modulation to different directions, you give up the main beam gain. So it's switching elements off, it's doing different types of modulations in order to do that. In our case, we don't have to do that. When you implement the, the, the spatial modulation, uh, the main beam gain is unaffected. That's fascinating. I just, uh, you know, it's like, I've, I've, re I've, it's been remarkable, the reliability of electric fully electronic systems over, you know, mixed mechanical and electrical. And, you know, I mean, to the point of 
you know, no, we don't want to even connect, you know, connectors in and out are a problem. And so I just, it, it's fascinating that this may be a mechanical system, electromechanical system where you really need that mechanical element to stay there. You know what I mean? There's not a, a substitute, electronic substitute that's of equivalent value. Um, if, if, I don't know if you're following me, but I, I'm, no, that's the case. I, that is uh, the case. I mean, the, the, this is a degree of freedom that you know we can use because of the nature of this this system. You know, it's static implemented system. Well, I, yeah, I, I guess you could imagine, um, you know, in the in the UAV case or the drone case, you know, was, um, I don't know. You could suppose you could mount it on a motor, right, and you know, control quite accurately <clears throat> or something, and, you know. And we've and, actually, you know. We've actually implemented this type of system, just kind of rotating it on a motor. We we had a paper that's going to be out in um, transactions on geoscience and remote sensing that's using this this specific technique here on notionally on an aerial platform to actually do ground scene classification just by by spinning it around. Um, but that's, it only it only, uses, it only uses two elements, which is the nice thing. I mean, you got the the motion of it, but it's only two elements. Mm. So it's very simple. Right, and then and and I suppose for space applications, real you know setting something in motion uh, is something that you can do extremely reliably. I, yeah. I imagine, right? So yeah, good point. I yep. get that. Yep. <clears throat> um, well, I'm looking forward to meeting you at uh, IMS. Yeah. Um, do it. Are there any other questions uh, uh, for our speaker? Just push the raise hand button and uh, we'll click on the button to ask you to unmute. You can unmute. Um, I'm seeing none. So, Professor, thank you so much again. Uh, this is an awesome talk. And, uh, you know, it, it, one, 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 maybe one quick last question. Yeah. I, I, I personally um, pay attention to I guess, I don't know if NASA was the first to define it, I certainly see some Air Force like adherence to the technology readiness level idea, right? And so, you know, TRL-1 is like, hey, we, we saw something that looks interesting. And TRL-2 is something like, well, we demonstrated something in a very controlled environment and that shows that we should take the next step. And somewhere around five is, you know, a prototype in the, real world environment and then you know nine i think is hey we flew it and it's doing great where would you say this technology is uh, on a technology readiness level scale yeah that's a that's an excellent question and, I, and I'm, I'm totally going to try not to answer that one but um what, <laughs> what i will say is what we so my vision for this is is UAV platforms, satellite platforms that are doing everything in terms of open loop distributed beam forming. That's a ways away. Okay, we're we're hitting the we're we're proving that the fundamental challenges are we can be feasibly addressed. So the mm -hmm. the, the basic challenges we've come a long way on those. We've have some demonstration systems. We've moved moved those along. So there are spinoff technologies at this point that I do think you know, in the right context would certainly be feasible for higher TRLs you can envision, um, uh, you know, implementing in, in certain ways, but, you know, kind of the focus and the drive is to get to that, that long-term goal. So I'm going to, I'm going to try to sidestep your question and say that um, the fundamental technologies, I'm, I, we've moved them along to the point where they're feasible for what, um, for addressing these fundamental challenges, there's a lot to do before we get to that completely arbitrary beam forming um, architecture. Got it. Okay, well, um, thanks again. I guess uh, I, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, close the session uh, uh, with uh, just a quick um, announcement about next week's talk, if I can get to my chat again. Uh, let's see. Uh, what's, what's 